Hey, good afternoon. I've got two things for you today. We got the Hundred Years War and the Italian Renaissance. And on Thursday we'll have the Northern Renaissance and how the Renaissance changed everything. So uh, this is just the first part of the Renaissance here. All right, first thing first, Hundred Years War. And it really uh, lasts 116 years, but who's counting? All right, the origins of this war. This is really kind of the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the Renaissance. So it kind of goes in both spaces, which is why I've put it here. Uh, there are the underlying causes and there's the immediate cause. The underlying cause, many of you put this into your discussion posts. Uh, yes, England wanted to regain land in France. Uh, once upon a time, the English government, the English kings owned more land in France than the French kings did. But by the time we get into the 1300s, that's kind of changing a little bit. It, it's closer to 50-50 by the time we get to, uh, to the Hundred Years' War. The French, of course, they want to drive out the English. They want to make France French again. And there's also this competition over wool trade in a place called Flanders. Flanders is today known as Belgium. Uh, England had a bunch of sheep, and they would send their wool to Belgium have it turned into cloth, and then the English would buy that cloth back. France wanted that wool trade. They wanted Flanders, and they wanted to keep the English out. Another underlying cause is chivalry. Uh, there are only so many damsels in distress. There are only so many jousting competitions you can win. The real chance to get uh, honor and to meet your your uh, chivalry duties is for battlefield glory so you had to have a fight to go and be chivalrous and then there's also internal issues war is always a good way to distract from social issues economic issues political issues both england and france were having plenty of those so a good old-fashioned war will distract you from all of that now the immediate cause the spark that sets off the gunpowder, if you will, is the dispute over the French throne. Now here you have a very poorly drawn family tree of the kings of France, and I'm going to blame this on my two-year-old. He did this, not me. Definitely not, not me. It was my two-year-old. And you'll see here, uh, Philip III had a couple of kids. I've got on here Philip IV, and Margaret of France. Both Philip IV and Margaret of France were kids of Philip III. Because Philip IV was A, a male, and B, the oldest, Philip IV became king after Philip III. Margaret of France goes on to marry fairly well. She marries Edward I, the King of England. Now Philip IV is gonna go on to have three kids. He's gonna have a kid named Louis, a kid named Philip, and a kid named Isabella. Now, Louis the Tenth is going to have one child. That child's name is John. John dies as uh, an infant. And John is technically king for, I think, it's six months while he is less than a year old. Once Louis and John are both dead, it then goes to Philip the Fourth's next oldest kid, who was Philip the Fifth. Philip V has a son named Charles. Charles himself doesn't have any kids. So then it has to go to the next closest kid, which would be Isabella. Isabella can't become king because at the time there was no such thing as a queen of France. So technically, the next person who should have been king of France was the son of Isabella, Edward III of England. So that means, technically, an English king should have also been the French king. Okay, let's do it, because that's what's supposed to happen. But Philip III has another kid that's not on this list. So I did not put the third child of Philip III on here, because I wanted to give you a little suspense. Charles of Valois is the third child of Philip III. Now the way things were supposed to work, since Charles was passed over and the kingship went to a new generation, 
Charles is forever excluded. Charles can never become king. Charles' son can never become king. The son of Charles' son can never become king. You get the idea. But we're going to break the rules because we, as French people, don't want an English king. So a law is going to be passed saying the throne of France cannot be passed down through the female line was perfectly fine to do beforehand and had happened before. But now that the new king is going to be an English guy, we're going to change everything. So out of nowhere, Philip of Valois, who is the grandson of Philip III, never should have been even considered to be king, is going to get crowned as king. Now Edward III, who should be king and is rightfully king, sends a letter in 1337 to the French government saying, yo, what's up? I'm supposed to be your king. I am your true king. And the French are going to say, uh, no thanks, we've already got one. And they're going to just continue going like nothing's on. Edward feels cheated. Edward decides to fight for a throne that is his and is rightfully his. So Edward is going to declare war on France to get his French throne. Now this war is going to be fought almost completely on French soil. None of the fighting happens in England. There is some that happens in what be today Belgium, but mostly it's in France. The armies, there's going to be actual lords, actual princes, and in some cases, actual kings who do the fighting. Comparatively speaking, large populations are going to fight. Over 10% of the people of England over 10% of the people of France are going to fight in this. And the two armies are very different. Uh, the English army, they're going to use a lot of foot soldiers. They're going to use longbows. They're a professional fighting force that's paid for and loyal to the king. The French army, on the other hand, they're going to be cavalry soldiers, some foot soldiers, and a lot of crossbowmen. They're loyal to the individual lords. They're not loyal to the king of France. And loyalty only goes so far. You're loyal up to the point your life is in danger, and then your loyalty could change. So the English army, smaller but much more stable. French army, bigger but questionable. Now there are three battles that you should know. The first battle is the Battle of Crecy. It happens in 1346. It's the first time the crossbow and the longbow are going to fight each other. Uh, the crossbow, very accurate, but it's a short range. Uh, if you've ever shot a crossbow before, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's very hard to reload. It's slow to reload. Uh, it can jam easily. It can misfire. Uh, crossbows are deadly accurate, but it's a short range, and they take a lot of skill. A longbow, on the other hand, is dangerous. At 400 yards, it's deadly at 100 yards. So Four football fields away, you're going to have a bad day if a longbow hits you. 100 yards away, it's almost definitely a kill shot. A longbow, very quick to reload. It's not as accurate, but as soon as you can pull an arrow out of your quiver, you can shoot. On average, a good longbowman could let three arrows go for every one crossbow bolt. So it's not as accurate, but it's more deadly simply because you can put down more fire and fire quicker. Now at the Battle of Crecy, there's this blinding shower of arrows. The French cavalry are knocked off their horses. There's this huge mass confusion. And adding to it, the English are going to use cannons for the first time in history on the battlefield. Now, the cannons don't do a lot of damage, but they're going to enhance the confusion, and the French army basically disintegrates and runs off the battlefield. Now, in 1356, there's the Battle of Poitiers, and at the Battle of Poitiers, King John II, who is the King of France, is actually captured in battle. Uh, you know that a battle has gone badly when your king is captured. Uh, the king becomes a prisoner and is held for ransom, the French army falls apart, and the English kingdom in France called the Angevin Empire is almost totally recreated. But that's just going to be a temporary success. The most famous battle of the war, one that is still studied today, is the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. 
And this is one of those times I wish I was in class because I could do a big diagram and really tell you about this because this is a pretty interesting battle. Uh, king Henry, who was king at the time, he only has somewhere between six and 9,000 people. The numbers aren't exact out there just because accurate counts weren't kept. But we do know he had at least 6,000 less than 10. Uh, he only loses somewhere between three and 500 men, but we don't know how many were wounded. Uh, France, on the other hand, they bring somewhere between 15 and 36,000 people to the battle. The discrepancy there is whether servants actually fought or not. So that's why we have such a wide range there. 6,000 Frenchmen are killed and somewhere between 700 and 2,000 are captured. There are so many prisoners taken by the English army that King Henry orders the prisoners to be executed. Now that didn't actually happen. That was more of a scare tactic to keep the French prisoners in line. But just the fact that he had to order that and threaten to do that shows how overwhelming this victory was. The French army was just humiliated and it was a disaster all around. And this is one of the most decisive victories in all of military history. And it's something that I've had the pleasure of learning several times. Now there's also a very French name in here, Joan of Arc. You've probably heard of her, but may not know much about her. Uh, she was 17 years old and she was a shepherd tending sheep when she has visions telling her that she has been called on by God to rescue France. She's told that if she can get the Dauphin, which is the Prince of France, crowned as the new king, that France would win or at least fight to a draw. So Joan of Arc is able to procure some, <clears throat> excuse me, Joan of Arc is able to procure some weaponry, she gets some people to support her, she gets some armor, and she's able to lead a small army to the city of Orléans, where they rescue Prince Charles. Then they fight to the city of Reims, to the Cathedral of Reims, where all the kings have to be crowned, and Prince Charles is then crowned as King Charles the Seventh. Very shortly after this successful crowning, Joan of Arc is captured by the Burgundians, or Burgundians, I should say, who were French people who were allies of England. The Burgundians, they're going to sell Joan of Arc to the English, and the English put her on trial. They accuse her of being a witch, and then they burn her at the stake on May 30th, 1431. Joan of Arc is going to become a, a symbol of French resistance. She's going to become a symbol of uh, French pride. And the death and the life of Joan of Arc encourages the French to fight back. And the French decide to not lose. They don't necessarily win because it really ends in a draw. But they don't lose because of Joan of Arc. In reality, what happens is the English government gets tired of fighting the war. The English parliament says, okay, King, if you want to fight the, in the war, you can keep doing it, but we're not paying for you anymore. You have to use your own personal money. And the King of England says, I don't want to use my money. That's my money. And so the war ends. Now the overall impacts of the war, England, it's devastated financially. Um, a lot of money is spent a lot of noble families are killed off. If you use Ancestry.com and you think you have English ancestry, it will be very, very hard to trace your family back past this war because so many people died. The wool trade in Flanders, the Belgium wool trade is destroyed and England starts to develop its own wool trade, which, believe it or not, is going to end up causing the Industrial Revolution a couple hundred years later. The Hundred Years' War is going to directly lead to the War of the Roses. It's going to lead to an English Civil War and the strengthening of the English Parliament. And we'll talk about what happens with that right at the end of the class. And then this is going to free England from its concerns in France and England's going to start to overseas expansion. Now, before I do the impacts of the war in France, 
Today's secret word is chocolate. Why chocolate? It's almost Easter. And if we can't do anything else for Easter, we can still eat chocolate. So word of the day is chocolate. All right, impacts of the war in France. France has a bigger population loss than England did because most of the fighting was in France. Thousands of acres of farmland is destroyed and there's a famine as well. In France, the English, I'm sorry, in France, the French monarchy is going to get stronger. Joan of Arc gets Charles crowned. Joan of Arc sent by God. That means Charles is chosen by God. Divine intervention, divine monarchy, absolute monarchy. And that is one of the things we talk about when World History II begins, is how France gets strong because of the strengthening of the French monarchy. Now, the Italian Renaissance, uh, what is it? Well, the Renaissance, it's actually a long period of time. It's not like somebody woke up and said, oh, I'm going to be Renaissance-y today. The Renaissance really lasts about 300 years. And there are three really big hallmarks, three big um, descriptors, if you will. There's this extreme hostility to the Middle, Middle Ages. In fact, it's the people of the early Renaissance who refer to the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages. There's this fascination with ancient Rome. There's this fascination with ancient Greece. People rush to learn Greek and Latin and try to rediscover all of the stuff from those ancient times. And then it starts as a relatively small group of educated people. And then it eventually spreads out to other classes, but that spread is very slow. Another question people have is why does it start in Italy? Well, it's because Italy was not united. It was not united by a king. It is not a feudalistic society with damsels in distress or chivalry or knights in shining armor. None of that happens in Italy. Italy remains independent city states, which means there's a lots of different leaders, lots of different ideas. Italy also had money. The most famous family is the de Medici family. They're from Florence. The Medicis are going to be the bankers for the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church, remember, it's a worldwide organization. It is not just a religion. It is a government, and it brings in a lot of money. And then you have the middle class. The middle class, they've got money for the first time, and they want to show off money by buying nice things. Another big reason, Italy's urban. In urban settings, you know, in cities, things can be spread much quicker, ideas go further, and people talk. And then last but not least, Italy is surrounded by Roman ruins. These Roman ruins make people say, oh, why can't we go back to the ways of Rome? They were so great. And so the Italians start to find ways to recreate Rome. Two big keywords for the Italian Renaissance, individualism and secularism. Renaissance thinkers, they start focusing on the individual. Um, a great example of this is the autobiography. I mean, just think of how self-centered you have to be to think that your life story is so good and so important that you can write a book about yourself and have others read it. That's how focused on the individual they are. I'm the most important. Creators wanted credit for their work. There is a very famous sculpture called the Pieta it is the Virgin Mary holding Jesus after he's been cru uh, crucified. People used to think that Donatello created it when it was really Michelangelo. And Michelangelo got so mad that he was not given credit for the work that he carved his name in it in big letters just to make sure people knew it was him. These Renaissance thinkers and creators, they also want attention. You start to get these fancy dresses these fancy manners where people do weird things like wash their hands and take baths. And people start using dinnerware, forks, knives, spoons. So it's a real step forward for personal hygiene and manners. Consumerism becomes important. People are worried about displaying their wealth and showing off how much money they have. 
And this is made possible because paintings become cheaper and easier to do. And you could hire a painter or an artist to make whatever you want. It didn't matter. If you want somebody to draw you riding a horse in a sports car, driving down the road, you could hire somebody to do that. And then there's this idea that time is money. Um, Renaissance creators want to make money and so they want to find easier ways to do things. Now, none of this is focused on religion. That's what secularism is. Secularism is the real world. So it's all about individual. What can I do? What can I make? What can I buy? And it's all based on the real world. It's not based on spiritualism. It's not based on religion. Another big part of this is humanism. It's a study of what makes man truly human. Uh, there's a guy named Erasmus who says men are made, not born. And it's no longer enough just to live to be human. Now to be truly human, you have to become educated. Now they're not non-religious. Humanists still believe that, that uh, angels and God and heaven and all that are real. But they say man is the best of God's creations and we must be educated so we can get as close to God as possible. Now humanists are going to go back and look at the ancient Roman texts. They're going to look at the ancient Greek texts. They're going to retranslate all these old writings and try to find new meanings in them. <coughs> Excuse me. Renaissance art is what we most often think about. And I've got three examples here. You got the Mona Lisa on the left, top left. You've got the Last Supper at the top right. And then at the bottom, you have the School of Athens. And what all these things have in common is they tend to show people more realistically, brighter colors, new ideas, controversial ideas. Um, art, because it's being purchased by individuals, it doesn't necessarily have to have religious themes. This Renaissance art could just be whatever you want. Bodies are presented more realistically. Bodies are presented more scientifically. People are painted as they appear. Michelangelo, one of the most famous people of all time to be an artist, would pay grave robbers to dig up bodies, bring them to his workshop, and then Michelangelo would dissect these people to figure out how the human body goes together. Why? So he could paint and sculpt the human body accurately. New technologies such as oil paintings meant that new colors could be created. Uh, you could make art in new environments. Before this, they used something called a fresco, which is basically egg white and plaster. And you could not paint a new layer or a new color until the old color dried. With oil painting, you can mix colors together and things went much quicker. And there are artists who, once again, they're just interested in making money. There's a Dutch German artist named Albrecht Durer. And instead of sitting there and making all of these paintings by hand, he figured out, why don't I just make a carving out of wood and then I can stamp that wood carving in paint and make replicas and duplicates. Basically, Albrecht Durer invents a very, very old copy machine and makes money off of it. Now, last but not least is this guy named Niccolo Machiavelli. Uh, he writes a book called The Prince, which was a very, very important book of its time. And it's this how-to manual on how to govern. Uh, Niccolo Machiavelli is based out of Florence, Italy. This was really written for the Medici family, but others start to read it. And it's filled with all sorts of harsh device, uh, advice. It's basically uh, do what you need to do to stay in power. Sometimes you have to be nice. Sometimes you have to be firm. Sometimes you have to be loving. Sometimes you have to kill people. The Prince is a very interesting book. And then it's very often considered one of the first, if not the first, political science work of history. All right. Now, last but not least, the one thing to go over that is not related to classwork, but it is important. So I hope you do hear this before uh, the time you need to hear it. 
Um, summer classes are only going to be online. There will be no face-to-face -face summer classes this year. And that's mainly because of everything that's going on with the world, social distancing, etc., etc. But we will still be having classes. They're just going to be online. So I do encourage you, sign up for classes. Give us something to do over the summer. And get another class or two out of the way while you've got all this time. And get yourself closer to graduation, whatever your goal might be. Now, to get registered for class, you have to do registration. And registration this year is going to be done on Monday. Uh, it will only be summer registration. Fall registration will not be open yet at this time because we're waiting to see what fall will look like. But on Monday, summer registration will open. Do sign up for a summer class. Starving teachers need something to do over the summer. And all summer classes will be online. All right. That's it for today. Make sure you look at the course calendar. Complete any work you may need by Sunday. We'll have another video come out on Thursday, another PowerPoint tomorrow, Wednesday, and uh, we'll just keep going until the end of the semester. As always, if you need anything, reach out to me, Discord, email, Blackboard Messenger, whatever it might be, and I'll help you any way I can. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.